So what we're going to talk about uh, in the next 15 minutes here or so is the forgotten ventricle, uh, the, the RV, and the tricuspid, uh, the right-sided valves. Um, and, and I think the reason is because, one, is they're harder to image. Um, what I'm going to try to convince you is that uh, CMR may offer advantages uh, in this arena for, for evaluation of the right heart, as well as for assessment of right-sided heart valves. Uh, and it's got numerous uh, potential advantages, as I talked about yesterday, uh, for evaluating the left-sided valves, which is you have a large field of view, you have unlimited imaging planes, uh, and you can give very nice quality images. But I want to go a little bit beyond that uh, and talk about the fact that I think our goal here is not simply to identify that there's dysfunction of the ventricle or there's dilatation of the right ventricle. I think the ideal imaging modality is going to be one that, one, gives us very good endocardial definition, is able to give us quantitative measures that don't require any geometric assumptions, that gives us reproducible measures, and for which we have uh, well-established reference normal ranges. And I think the reason it's important is because, remember, the RV has a very unusual shape. Compared to the, the LV, which is nice and circular, the RV is uh, crescent shape, and as a result, if you just simply do a two-dimensional uh, uh, long-axis view, well, just depending upon where uh, you sliced the left ventricle and the right ventricle, the size of the RV can change quite a bit. And, and obviously, this is the same patient, but yet, depending upon if I have a, a cut that's a little bit more anterior versus a cut that's a little bit more inferior, the RV can look much bigger or much smaller. And so obviously, we want a technique that doesn't uh, give us artificial values uh, simply based on the location that we did the cut. So where I think CMR is helpful is that we actually are able to measure the right ventricular volumes, both in endiastole and systole. And again, this is done by acquiring serial short axis slices. And as I talked about yesterday, where we would measure the left ventricular micro or, uh, contours, we could do the exact same thing for the right ventricle. Uh, and as a result, you're able to summate the volumes of each of these individual slices of the RV and derive a volume for the right ventricle in endiastole. You do the exact same thing in end systole, and you get RV and systolic volume. And then obviously by subtracting those two, you get a stroke volume, and then you can calculate an ejection fraction from that. So uh, the, the data with CMR, there's, there's numerous studies which are shown here on the right-hand side, uh, provides with fairly accurate and reproducible measurements uh, with fairly low intra and intra-observer variability on the order, though, of about 5 to 6 percent. Now, that, that contrasts a little bit with the LV, where the, the interstudy variability with CMR is about 2 to 3 percent. So we know that the RV, no matter what imaging modality you use, is always going to be a little bit more challenging. But I think it's still, with CMR, we get fairly reasonable uh, ability to uh, derive uh, RV volumes and RV functions. And as a result, I think many guidelines uh, reference CMR as potentially a tool for initial clinical assessment uh, of RV volumes and EF, as well as the impact of, of right-sided regurgent lesions, as well as for long-term serial follow-up of these patients. Now, uh, there's, uh, a f you know, there's a fair bit of normal reference value data that's available, and this was a recent publication which uh, looked at uh, normal values for both men, stratified by male, as well as women. Uh, and then obviously index that to body surface area, and I think that's an important thing to do. And in addition to that, we have actually a, 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 another publication which came out just a few years ago, which very nicely stratifies it by uh, age. And I think this is very important because one of the things you'll notice, if you look at what the range, so what's shown here is the mean value and then the two standard deviation range, the lower and the upper limits. Now you'll notice the upper limits of RV and diastolic volume index for a 29, you know, for a 20 year old can be as high as 114 mLs. Uh, versus obviously if you look at patients that are much older, the upper limits are less than 100. So I think it's important to, to look at this based on age because what you, what you don't want to do is start calling young patients with really ventricles that are normal for their size as actually being dilated. So I think that's very important to be able to have this uh, stratified range of normal values. And this, in this publication, we have it based on for both men as well as women, shown in the two graphs or the two charts here. Now let's move on to the valves on the right side. So 
The tricuspid valve is what I'm going to focus on, and then I'll touch a little bit on the pulmonic valve as well. So obviously, if you look at the anatomy of the tricuspid valve, it's three leaflets, and there's the septal leaflet, which is, uh, sits next to the interventricular septum, the posterior or inferior leaflet, which sits inferiorly, and then the anterior leaflet, which sits along the RV free wall. And the causes of pathology uh, really can be broken down into primary as well as secondary. Primary causes would include rheumatic, myxomatous, Epstein's anomaly, uh, endocardial fibrosis, carcinoid disease, trauma, or iatrogenic, such as pacemakers, ICDs, or RV biopsies. And then secondary causes, most common obviously being due to left heart disease, uh, or, but it can also be from anything that causes pulmonary hypertension, as well as intrinsic uh, disease of the right ventricle. Um, and in clinical practice, what we tend to see much more common uh, is really secondary disease than we do primary disease for, for most uh, uh, routine practices. Now, uh, obviously, there's uh, uh, you know, a, a number of uh, echo guidelines that can aid also in how you quantify tricuspid regurgitation. There's the American Society of Echo Guidelines from 2003. They're now being updated uh, and should be out later this year with Dr. Zogby's chairing. And then there's also the European guidelines, which came out uh, in 2010. And the one thing I'll highlight from the European guidelines is, and again, there may be some controversy about this number, but at least in the European guidelines, they suggest that a regurgent volume of greater than 45 mLs would be considered severe tricuspid regurgitation. Now again, some of this may be due to the fact that the, the vast majority of uh, cases that we tend to see in practice tend to be secondary uh, tricuspid regurgitation. But I think just, again, just be aware that the European guidelines call for a different cutoff uh, for uh, regurgitant volume uh, to, to uh, stratify a patient as having severe regurgitation. Now, let me move on to some example cases and talk a little bit about how uh, we would quantify tricuspid regurgitation uh, using CMAR methodology. So here's a patient, and uh, using the techniques that I talked about already to look at the right ventricle, we were able to derive that this person's right ventricular end diastolic volume is 185 mLs, and the RV ejection fraction is 67%. So we've got a dilated LV. This is an older patient with a normal RV ejection fraction. <clears throat> and you can see with CMR, in addition to getting the standard four-chamber view that we would typically get, we also can obtain a, uh, a short axis view up at the level of the tricuspid valve allows us to identify where this uh, jet is. Uh, and in addition to that, we can also get uh, additional long axis views of the right ventricle. So this is what we call an RV two-chamber view. So this is the anterior free wall of the RV, and this is the diaphragmatic or inferior wall of the RV, and here's your uh, right atrium, and there's a right atrial appendage. You can see the tip of right there. And then this is the uh, RV three-chamber, or what we call the RV inflow-outflow view. And so orientation-wise, here's your superior vena cava, right atrium, tricuspid valve, the right ventricle, RV outflow tract is here, the pulmonic valve, and then the main pulmonary artery. Um, and so again, because CMR is able to give you, uh, you know, essentially any Im imaging plane that you want, uh, we're able to uh, very accurately uh, look at the right ventricle from multiple different orientations in addition to the standard short and four chamber views. Um, and then when it comes to quantifying the severity of tricuspid regurgitation, we're going to use the same methodology that we use for mitral uh, regurgitation, which is basically uh, we call uh, the indirect method where we compare the stroke volume of the ventricle, so in this case the right ventricle, uh, based on planimetry of the end diastolic and end systolic volume. Uh, once you know what the RV stroke volume is, we can also measure using the phase contrast techniques that I talked about yesterday, the amount of flow coming across the pulmonary artery. So in this example case here, there's 110 cc's of RV stroke volume. That means the difference between end diastolic and end systolic volume was 110 cc's. The pulmonary artery flow based on phase contrast was 60 mLs. Therefore, by subtracting these two, we can derive that the volume of blood that's going backward across this tricuspid valve must be 50 mLs. And then from that, you can also de derive a tricuspid regurgent fraction, which is simply the 50 divided by the total RV stroke volume of 110, giving you a, a regurgent fraction of 
Um, and the other uh, unique advantage I think with CMR also can be in helping us to identify the mechanism of the abnormality. So in this case, if I, if I show you this short axis view, which is up at the level of the aortic valve, you can see this is from an orientation standpoint, left atrium, right atrium, tricuspid valve, right ventricle, and RV alpha tract. Uh, and this arrow is trying to show you the fact that it looks like the, the jet is actually not originating at the coaptation point, but is actually originating a little bit inferior to that. I think if you look at the view on the right-hand side, you can, this RV three-chamber view, you can probably appreciate that a little bit better. And I'll show you one other view, which I think hopefully uh, will make it much easier to see. If you look at the, the asterisk, points to where the coaptation zone is, but in fact, the regurgitation seems to be rising uh, more lateral to that uh, here along the anterior leaflet of the tricuspid valve. And this is a patient who was post uh, a heart transplant who'd had multiple uh, biopsies of the RV, and the postulated mechanism here was probably that during one of the biopsies they may have perforated through the tricuspid leaflet. So in addition to quantitating the severity, you can actually also uh, identify potentially the mechanism of the abnormality. Um, here uh, are other findings that we can look at, such as uh, the presence of a dilated tricuspid annulus. Uh, you can identify or, or evaluate the IVC and hepatic veins with CMR. You can see in this example case that those are also dilated. Um, and here's an example of a patient who, uh, <clears throat> just off this initial four-chamber view, you can see that the tricuspid valve leaflets uh, appear to be retracted uh, and shortened and you can see it looks like almost wide open, a significant tricuspid regurgitation. Uh, and, and then in addition, again, to the standard four-chamber view, we're going to get these additional views as well, the RV two-chamber as well as the RV three-chamber view, to try to interrogate uh, all of the leaflets of the tricuspid valve. And uh, here's an example of a patient who has uh, Epstein's anomaly, and you'll notice that that septal leaflet is, is apically displaced. You can see the coaptation zone is much more uh, apically displaced than you would normally expect. You can see the signal void from the tricuspid regurgitation that's over here. Um, and obviously, uh, for patients with this abnormality, uh, it's important not only to identify the severity of tricuspid regurgitation, but also to look for other associated abnormalities as well, such as PFOs, ASDs, VSDs, and also to calculate uh, shunts if there are any uh, uh, other associated anomalies. So let me just uh, wrap up here and, and just, just kind of quickly touch on the pulmonic valve, because I think also this is a, an area which is a strength of CMR. Uh, and with the pulmonic valve, um, you know, uh, Again, it starts by assessing what the RV volumes are and the RV ejection fraction is, because again, those are going to be what we use as our triggers for uh, when a patient would uh, need to go on for intervention. You can also appreciate that there's septal flattening here during systole. And if I show you this phase contrast uh, image here, you can see uh, on this RV outflow view that there's reverse flow occurring in diastole, and that's your pulmonic regurgitation. And the way we would quantify this, again, is by uh, placing a phase contrast CMR uh, above the pulmonic valve, so basically in the main pulmonary artery. Uh, and then using that phase contrast technique, drawing an ROI, we can actually determine what is the, the volume of forward flow coming across the pulmonic uh, valve, the pulmonary artery, as well as the volume of reverse flow is occurring during diastole. And then obviously, uh, by dividing these two, you, you derive a pulmonic regurgitant fraction. And then this is just one example of publication showing uh, that the uh, PR uh, volumes derived by uh, this phase contrast technique uh, correlated reasonably well with uh, values that were derived by uh, uh, Reichardt catheterization. Uh, and then um, here's an example of a, a pulmonic valve that is actually quadricuspid, as you can appreciate. And so again, the nice thing with CMR is we're able to get a very nice view of the valve anatomy itself. And then let me wrap up here uh, with an example of a bicuspid pulmonic valve with, again, dilated pulmonary artery distal to that from the flow disturbance. 
And then uh, lastly, the, you know, probably the one biggest limitation I think of CMR is this inability to assess pressures. And I think that's where routinely for non-invasive imaging, we go to echocardiography to try to at least get a, a surrogate marker of, of pulmonary artery pressures. Although there is some data suggesting that, that we might be able to at least get some uh, derivations of pulmonary artery pressures. And this is one example publication from a couple years ago where they looked at the, the uh, one, the right ventricular mass, as well as the, the angle of the septal displacement during uh, systole. And then uh, using an uh, initial cohort, came up with an equation that they then tried to validate in a validation cohort, showing that it showed a reasonable correlation with pulmonary artery pressures uh, measured at right heart catheterization. So again, I would say this is not something that's routine clinical application, but I think this is uh, an area that there's active investigation underway. Uh, so to summarize, you know, I think CMR provides uh, excellent visualization of the RV and accurate assessment of RV volumes and function. Uh, low variability and is useful for serial uh, measurements. Uh, is able to give us a, a quantitative measure of tricuspid and pulmonic insufficiency. And then obviously pulmonary artery pressure assessment uh, is something that I think is still uh, in the works. So thank you for your attention.